In this episode of Roach Reflections, I'd like to talk about casters, a natural follow-on from maggots. Casters have been used for bait as long as maggots have. When anglers found that their maggots were turning into casters, they often hooked them on, maybe did a maggot caster cocktail and caught fish. They also found that if you just took the casters as they were, on top of the maggots as they turned, that once they got a bit darker, they floated. So they weren't so good for a, as a sinking bait. They did find that the darker ones were often the best bait and on the hook that was fine, but feeding them was a problem. Back in the 1950s, Benny Ashurst, who was from Lee in Lancashire and a top canal angler of that time, discovered that if he used a, a riddle, a sieve, to sieve off the casters as they came off the maggots, he could stop them at a certain stage of development while they were still sinkers. And by put, putting them in water, he could separate the sinkers from the floaters. The floaters, he might keep a few back as hook baits. He now had sinking casters. And because he was a maggot breeder, he had sinking casters in quantity. He could riddle off gallons of maggots that were turning and get pints of casters and share them with his son Kevin and other fishing mates that he travelled with. Initially he was using casters as a bait to fish across the fairly narrow canals of Lancashire to catch better roach in the later stages of a match. Back then most people fished very close in for small fish. He found the patience game of fishing casters on the far side while catching the small fish early on would give him a bonus of maybe four or five better roach right at the end of the match, enough to tip the balance in his favour. In the late 50s the River Trent was heated artificially by power stations, coal-fired power stations that were right down through its length. This made the water warm, especially during the week and on a Saturday. By Sunday the water had cooled a bit because the power stations backed off their production of electric as the factories weren't open at the weekend so much. What this meant was that the Trent being very warm had fish at all levels. And what Benny did and his mates and Kevin as well, his son, they went to the Trent with their stick floats, which were canal floats, and they started to fish casters on the drop, holding back and letting the stick float run alternatively with casters. Back then, the traditional Nottingham style had been heavier floats with maggots, and that wasn't so good for the on the drop fishing. So the Ashursts and others had an advantage over the traditional knots anglers who fish centre pins. Benny was using a, a probably a Mitchell 300 back then. Other anglers cottoned on in the early 60s, people like Ivan Marks. And people started to take casters to other waters like the Neen, the Witham, the Welland, the Warwickshire Avon, the Severn. And as time went on, more and more waters got used to casters. The fish became accustomed to them and people did very well with them. This was particularly true in 1972 when Ivan Marks predicted that the Bristol Avon National would be one with casters and Phil Coles, his protégé, won the match with over 30 pounds of chub and, and skimmers. The locals at that time had said, oh no, the Bristol Avon, we always fish with bread, that's the best bait. But Ivan reasoned that with all the Midlands anglers from Birmingham, Coventry, Leicester, etc., travelling down and practising fishing the matches and so on with casters. The fish would get used to casters and would respond well to them and that's exactly what happened. The same happened on the Middle Thames, places like Medley or Oxford in the middle, mid 70s. Anglers were using casters there. And anglers started to combine casters with hemp as a feed. So they'd feed hemp and casters in equal quantities but fish casters on the hook. They weren't fishing the hemp on the hook very much at all. Not to say that didn't happen, it did happen, but the combination became known as a very successful one. Casters are a very good roach bait, which is what this series is about. 
uh, they are also a very good bait for lots of other fish. The hemp and caster combination proved fantastic in people using it with feeders for chub and barbel. Bream switched on to it eventually on the Fenland waters like the Witham and the Welland, the Neen. And people have caught most fish on casters. Even perch will take a caster once they get the taste for them. Uh, eels will go for them. They, they're fairly tiddler proof. There are times when you get shelled every cast by bleak with casters on the slower water, especially places like the Thames when it's, they're really prolific at times. But generally it's a, a fairly tiddler proof bait. We used to use them on the upper Dorset style when minnows were bad to avoid, the, to avoid them and to get the Dacen roach. There are one or two methods that are really special for roach with casters. One is to lay on with casters on the upper stair when there are a lot more big roach. I found that if I fished a stick float, not a massively heavy one, but one taking about six number four, set it about a foot over depth and found those swims where there was a, a lily bed with a bit of slack water by the side of it with a nice gravel bottom and feeding just about every 20 minutes, about 20 casters, not, not all the time, not constant, and fishing double caster on an 18, laid on the bottom and just leaving it there. And every time I caught a fish, I would feed, and it was, it was patience. You wouldn't pull them out one after another, 15, 20 minutes. Each time you caught a fish, the shoal would scatter, actually watch this happening. They'd move away from the swim, then they'd come back again. So if you fed when you were playing a fish or immediately after you landed it, the roach weren't in the swim. But when they came back, and they'd come back within about five minutes or so, there was some more bait for them, waiting for them. Because in that sort of 20 minutes, they'd have gobbled up quite a few of the casters. I still do use casters sometimes. Uh, they're dearer than maggots. They're about four pounds a pint around here. I sometimes think to myself I ought to use them more. There was a time when I'd buy three or four pints without fail every week. I was match fishing every week and they were an essential match fishing bait. Some people probably think that they're an obsolete bait. They're certainly not. I know lots of people use uh, pellets and forms of pellets on the rivers and on uh, commercials and other natural waters. Maggots are probably more popular than casters by a long way. Casters don't keep the same way as maggots. Maggots, you can uh, keep them for at least a week and they're still fairly good. Casters, you ideally want fresh ones. As far as roach are concerned, ones that have just been turned and within a couple of days, they are vacuum packed and all the rest of it, but that doesn't mean they're as fresh as they ought to be. So here's a tip for when the weather gets a bit warmer. Maybe buy a pint of casters, give them a try, see how you get on. Be committed to them. Don't say, oh, I think I'll take bread, I think I'll take maggots. Just take some casters. If it's in the summer and autumn, take some hemp as well. So if you've got a pint of casters, pint of hemp, mix the two together. Keep your casters moist if it's hot and sunny. Once they dry out, they'll start to turn a bit more. And before you know it, you'll have floaters. You want sinking casters. One aspect of using casters is how you hook them on. In the early days, there were what they called caster hooks, which had fairly long shanks, very fine wire and a round bend. And people used to insert the point in the blunt end of a caster, turn that hook around and then push the bend of the hook into the bottom of the caster. So that most of the shank was actually inside the caster, just the spade end outside. In fact, in the early days, they were still using silk whipped hooks, which didn't have a spade at all. That weighs okay. You can get in really big casters, you can get a size 16 inside, or the old size 16s inside a caster. Although actually finding proper caster hooks is unlikely nowadays. Very few hooks are that sort of shape. Ivan Mark's preferred method was to use a much smaller hook and just hook nick them on like a maggot through the blunt end. And he said he'd rather use a, a 22 fine wire hook just nicked on than a big buried hook. 
he said that the weight of the hook would affect how the caster behaved in the water so the very much smaller lighter hook wouldn't weigh the caster down so much but because the hook was outside of the caster it had better hooking power than the buried hook because the buried hook wouldn't always um, come outside the shell of the caster and one of the tricks with uh, burying the hook was to have the point actually emerging slightly on the, the outside of the caster something that took quite a bit of skill to do but worth considering. I've long been a fan of using double bait so with casters often I would use double caster as well as single casters and obviously for bigger fish like chub and barbel it, it was common to use treble or quadruple casters a great bunch of them. I hope this has been useful in talking about casters they can be a phenomenal bait one of the great record roach that Ray Clark's rec £4.3 record from the Dorset Star was caught on casters so they've got a good pedigree as far as roach are concerned. Please click like and subscribe and uh, cheerio for now.